Picture a young internal medicine resident sobbing in the back hallway of the county hospital. She had been paged by the intensive care unit nurse about a patient whose blood pressure had plummeted after giving birth to her first child. Her adrenaline was pumping and her heart was racing. The attending physician had just screamed at her for not having acted quickly enough and she literally fell apart, unable to think or even breathe. Fortunately, in that situation, the patient recovered quickly. The resident, not so quickly. That young doctor in training, of course, was me. I have often looked back on that situation, and many others like it, and wished that I understood then what I know about stress, how it affects our minds and bodies, and how to counteract the effect of stress on our minds and bodies. We all know what stress feels like. Our heart is racing. Uh, we have rapid, shallow breathing. We have a pit in our stomach. We have that dryness in the back of our throat. Our palms are all sweaty. Uh, I'm describing myself right now. <laughs> but what we may not know is that our blood pressure is skyrocketing. Stress hormones are being released and our entire body is functioning differently. We are in the fight or flight response. This is great if you're an antelope being chased by a big cat for dinner, but not so good if you want to solve a complex problem or perform on stage. Not only are our bodies functioning differently, our brains are functioning differently too. Our amygdala, our emotion center, is overwhelming our prefrontal cortex, the part of our brain that allows us to be patient and reason, we have become reactive instead of proactive. Our ability to problem solve is compromised. As an internal medicine physician, I am a witness daily to the toll that stress takes on our bodies and minds, especially when that stress is chronic. I see it manifested as high blood pressure, diabetes, and heart disease. I see chronic stress leading to behaviors such as overeating and using drugs and alcohol to excess, which in turn leads to obesity and addiction. The toll that chronic stress can take on our mental health can be devastating, leading to crippling anxiety and depression. I know personally because I have suffered from anxiety my entire life. My anxiety interfered with my relationships and interfered with my ability to live to my potential. I learned through the years that exercise and talking to friends helped. And as a doctor, I knew which medications to take and that therapy was beneficial too. But I had the sense that medications and therapy were not the entire answer. I had the sense that something was missing. I needed to find out what that was. Fortunately for me, about 17 years ago, my husband brought me to my first yoga class. Something between the sweat and the mat hit me. I was hooked. I began to practice more and more, and little by little, a shift began. I began to feel better. I became a yoga teacher because I had the sense that I could do as much healing on the mat as I could do in my exam rooms. Maybe there was a way I could combine what I was experiencing on the mat with what I had learned in medical school. Maybe there was a way I could share this experience with my patients so that they could benefit in the way that I had. But you know, we doctors, we're skeptics. It's not enough just to feel it in our own bodies. We need to understand why and how things work. We need to see proof and we need evidence. In my quest to discover, I went to the Mind Body Medicine Conference sponsored by the Benson Henry Mind Body Institute at Harvard Medical School. Bingo, it all made sense. 
The conference validated why and how practices like yoga, tai chi, meditation, mindfulness, and prayer work. I saw the scientific evidence and research supporting what I was feeling in my own body. It was exhilarating. And what I found was this. All of these practices have something in common. They elicit what is called the relaxation response. The relaxation was, response was first described by Dr. Herbert Benson in a book that he published in the 1970s. Dr. Herbert Benson is a cardiologist who practices medicine still today, and he described the practice of bringing your mind to a single point of focus, such as a breath, a mantra, or a prayer. And when your mind wanders, you gently bring it back. And when your mind wanders, you gently bring it back. And when you do this over and over again, a fundamental physiologic shift occurs in your body. Your blood pressure lowers. Your heart rate decreases. Stress hormones are no longer being released. And you begin to experience an internal state of peace and calm. So let's give it a try. By now, your mind has probably wandered to, I wonder what's for lunch. But let's try, take this time to bring it back to the moment. So I invite you all to uncross your legs. Let your feet rest lightly on the ground. And let your hands rest gently on your lap. Blink your eyes closed. Bring your awareness to the breath. Feeling the air coming in through the nose and going out through the nose. Feel the gentle rise and fall of your chest. If your mind wanders, bring it back. If your mind wanders, bring it back. Inhale to the count of one, two, three, four. Exhale, four, three, two, one. Inhale, one, two, three, four. Exhale, four, three, two, one. Blink your eyes open. Feel differently? So this is what you experience in the moment. But when you practice the relaxation response on a long-term basis, the benefits are even more profound. Functional MRI allows us to see different parts of the brain lighting up with different activities. We can see the amygdala, our emotion center, activated when we're under stress. We can observe the prefrontal cortex, the part of our brain that allows us to have selective attention, integrate our memory, and have moral decision-making light up in meditating monks. We can measure the size of the hippocampus. The hippocampus is our memory storage center, and it actually increases in size with long-term meditation. We can look at structures such as the insula and see that it thickens with long-term practice, the relaxation response. And the insula is what allows us to understand the relationship between our feelings and our thoughts. And it also helps us be aware of bodily processes, such as hunger. And scientists have observed that people who suffer from schizophrenia and bipolar illness have a thinner insula. So on a macro level, our brain function and structure changes. But on a microscopic level, cellular function and protein synthesis changes too with long-term practice of the relaxation response. For a microbiology nerd like me, this is mind-blowing. Mind-body practices can alter the way key genes are turned on and off. In our white blood cells, an integral component of our immune system, mind-body practices can turn on genes coding for proteins associated with energy metabolism and lengthen telomeres, telomeres being the caps on the ends of our DNA that allow for cellular longevity. 
mind-body practices can also turn off genes coding for proteins that cause and ignite the inflammatory response, such as NF-kappa B. And NF-kappa B appears to be a master switch for inflammation. The implications for our health and wellness are profound. Currently, the SMART program, which stands for Stress Management and Resilience Training, is being used to combat burnout in physicians at Harvard. It has been used with the World Trade Center responders in the New York Police Department to help them with their PTSD. I am thrilled to have just received a grant to be able to give the SMART program to my physician colleagues at Park Nicollet and Health Partners and study the effect on burnout and resilience. Why invest money in this kind of training? Because the economics makes sense. A research study done with a selected group of patients trained in the SMART program has shown that they decrease their health care costs by 40%. How do they do that? By decreasing the number of times they come to the emergency room for the visits. By decreasing the number of unnecessary lab tests and x-rays ordered by anxious physicians demanded by their patients and by decreasing the number of office visits in general. Think about that. In a time when healthcare costs are escalating, we have a low-cost, high-yield tool. I am lucky enough to have gone through the SMART program as a participant, and together with my yoga practice, I finally feel a measure of freedom from my own anxiety. I would not be standing on this stage today had I not. So let's imagine a new model for medicine. Imagine a patient comes in for treatment of their high blood pressure. The doctor gives them the best possible medication and great advice about exercise, losing weight, and a low-salt diet, but is also able to talk to the patient about the value of practicing the relaxation response and do that in a way that makes sense to them in terms of their culture and lifestyle. So for some, that's prayer. For others, it's an active yoga practice. For others, still, it's meditation. Six months later, the patient returns. She's exercising. She's sleeping better. Maybe she's lost a little weight. And lo and behold, her blood pressure is lower. She's able to get off her blood pressure-lowering medication. She's saving herself money. Because she no longer has to buy her blood pressure-lowering medication, she doesn't have to come in for lab tests to monitor the use of her blood pressure medication, and she doesn't have to come in as for frequent office visits. Most importantly, she feels empowered to take charge of her own health and well-being. But she's not only saving money for herself, she is saving the healthcare system money because she has significantly lowered her risk we're having a stroke, heart attack, and kidney failure. So what are the next steps? First and foremost, we need to educate our doctors on the value of training and stress management and resilience. We need to learn these practices ourselves so that we can model this behavior for our families and recommend it authentically to our patients. We need to add training and stress management and resilience to our medical schools and residency curricula, not just for the trainees, but ultimately also for their patients. So stress is part of all of our lives, and stress in and of itself is not a bad thing. In fact, we have learned on this stage today that overcoming stress and stressful situations can build resilience. But often we don't have those tools. Learning the skills of stress management through the relaxation response has the power to change the paradigm of medicine. It has the power to combine the best of Western medicine with giving our patients tools and skills to lead happier and healthier lives. It also has the power to heal us as physicians, to bring us back to why we went into the medicine in the first place. To educate, to heal, 
Give me a toast of and the to American come. dream. This is what gives me hope for the future of medicine. Put down the pen and look in my Thank eyes. You.